We pray in this Mass for an end to the civil unrest taking place across the United States, a civil unrest which is not anymore primarily a protest against the unjust, violent death of one man, George Floyd. No, what we are seeing is our justifiable distress over that being hijacked by a group of people coming in from the outside and motivated by an entirely different agenda to disrupt our civil life and to destabilize our society. These are people not who love life but who hate it, not who are concerned about America but hate it and want to destroy it. These are people not trying to advance justice but trying to advance hatred and we will not tolerate it and that is why our president Donald Trump last night took decisive action in uh, deploying more armed force to protect our streets and our neighborhoods urging the governors to do so and saying that to the extent that they did not do so uh, the federal government would in fact intervene and do it themselves. So we are uh, at a point where uh, this decisive leadership is so needed. We are grateful to have it. But of course, he also indicated the importance of spiritual leadership because last night after making uh, remarks in which he uh, made it clear what he was going to do to restore law and order, he walked across the street to a church. St. John's Church, a church of the presidents or multiple presidents have prayed just right across the street from the White House was burned by these uh, violent mobs uh, the other night. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the damage was, was contained, uh, but nevertheless, repairs are needed and the windows are boarded up. The president walked over to that church with the Bible in his hand and stood in front of that church together with some of his key cabinet members and other aides and held that Bible up in the air in a resolute, faith-filled stance for America, for peace, for justice, for love, and for the Word of God. That this violence directed even against churches will not stand in America. And that leads us to these passages we heard today, very appropriate. These are all the already assigned readings of today in the Catholic Church. That we await, as St. Peter tells us, new heavens and a new earth. This is the salvation that Jesus brings. It's not simply the salvation of souls. It's the salvation of communities. It's the salvation of relationships. It's the salvation of nations. It's the salvation of bodies. It's a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus renews everything. The physical as well as the spiritual. The communal as well as the individual. He saves it all. And this is the hope that Peter puts forth in his, in his word today. We await new heavens and a new earth in which, according to his promises, righteousness will dwell. The right relationship that we are called to have with Almighty God, purification and cleansing of sin, erasing of violence, conquering of hatred, right relationships with God and with each other. Now, how do we bring that about? Well, Christ is going to bring it about, but that doesn't mean we sit back and do nothing. We have our part to do as well. He says that we have to pray for the hastening of this day uh, of God. And he says, wait for it and also hasten it. In other words, do something to hasten the day of peace and justice. Well, what can we do? Jesus actually tells us in the gospel. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he says. Yes, give to God what is God. Pray. Proclaim his word, as we saw the president holding up the word of God last night in front of the nation. Advance that word, pass on that word, teach that word to your children. But give to Caesar what is Caesar's. What does this mean? This leads us to a reflection about our civic responsibility. And we see how important our civic responsibility is in times of civil disturbance as well as in times of peace. What kind of leadership are we choosing for ourselves? 
because the responsibility of our leaders first and foremost is to protect us. We have to choose those that are going to do a good job at doing that. How do we choose our leaders? How do we give to Caesar what is Caesar's? We be good citizens in this earth. We vote, we vote responsibly, we vote in an informed way. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. Now, this leads us to a reflection on the relationship between church and state. These are two different entities in our lives. Obviously, they intersect. They intersect in, in us because we are both citizens of the state and members of the church. And we can reflect on the distinction of their roles and also on the interconnection of their responsibilities. They have distinct roles. The church does not have a standing army. The church does not deploy the National Guard, okay, especially in times of disturbance like this. The church does not deliver the mail. At the same time, the state does not determine what readings we have in the Mass today. The, church, the state does not assign which uh, priest becomes the pastor of your parish or what, bishop, what man becomes the bishop of your diocese. The, the state does not determine uh, how many sacraments there are. So, you see, we have obviously a distinction of roles. But there's a an intersection of responsibilities to the dignity of human life, to the protection of people, all have that responsibility. And the church has every right and duty to speak up about human rights and human dignity. We saw our president speak up for it last night and on many other occasions. And our pastors have to speak up to it as well. This is where the responsibilities intersect. We are all in favor of human dignity and concerned about protecting human rights and human lives. And that's why, brothers and sisters, it is perfectly appropriate for the church to comment on the moral dimensions even of the life of the state and even of politics. The Second Vatican Council has a very powerful line in the 76th chapter of Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, a statement which then is uh, repeated in the catechism of the Catholic Church. And that statement is the church must always be free to spread her teachings and to pass moral judgment even in matters relating to politics when the fundamental rights of man or the salvation of souls requires it. So fundamental rights, the protection of life and liberty and property, fundamental rights, when they are threatened, the church can pass judgment, moral judgment, even on political programs, political parties, political candidates. The church must speak up on this. Now, we are all the church. So part of giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar is doing our role in electing Caesar, quote unquote. We don't have kings, we have representatives, right? We have people that write our laws and enforce our laws on our behalf because we willingly give them the authority to do so. Their powers derive from the consent of the governed as our Declaration of Independence says. So in other words, it's a moral responsibility to vote. Today, in fact, as we're having this mass in some seven states and in the Washington, D.C., there are elections taking place, primary elections, for the uh, 2020 election cycle. People in Iowa are voting, Indiana, Maryland, Montana, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Dakota, and Washington, D.C. and as the season goes on, we go th through the summer, there will be more primaries, and then, of course, into the fall, there will be early voting, and then there will be Election Day itself on November 3rd. We as Christians, we as Catholics, have a responsibility to vote. The Catechism says this, Submission to authority and co-responsibility for the common good make it morally obligatory to exercise the right to vote. Morally obligatory. The U.S. bishops have written in a beautiful document called Living the Gospel of Life, quote, every voice matters in the public forum, every vote 
counts. My friends, are you registered to vote? You can find out for sure at checkyourvoterregistration.com. But we're not going to be able to vote unless we're registered to vote. And we're not going to be registered to vote by magic. We have to make sure that we are and that our voter file is up to date. Check your voter registration dot com and you'll be able to find out. Then our responsibility continues after being registered to vote to get to know the candidates. There's a marvelous online guide to knowing where the candidates stand. It's called iVoterGuide.com. We at Priests for Life are partners in this effort to bring information to God's people about who these candidates are iVoterGuide.com. If we have the responsibility to vote, in other words, the responsibility to choose between candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, or how many other, however many others are running in a particular race, and we have the responsibility to do that for all these different races, do you know that in 2020 there are 100,000 different races that are going to be decided at every level of government? If we have the obligation to choose between the candidates, then we also therefore have the obligation to know what the differences are between the candidates. And it's not just differences between the candidates. It's differences between the parties. Candidates usually belong to a political party, and the political party has particular positions. The political party has a specific platform. The political party has certain beliefs and certain policy preferences. How can we make a morally responsible choice between candidate A who belongs to one party and candidate B who belongs to another without knowing what the parties stand for. It is our duty to know. And the information is out there, it's available. And again, iVoterGuide.com is one of the ways we find out. Then we also have to know what issues are most important and most critical. Now, we see the violence taking place in many of our cities, and, you know, it causes us to stop and think. We're also, we've been dealing for months with this pandemic and this, this, this terrible virus that has been claiming many lives. And it brings back to our hearts and minds, doesn't it, the fundamental question of life versus death. I mean, it's better to be alive. It's, it's, life is, is the most fundamental good that we have because everything else depends on it. Our education depends on first being alive, our, our, our right to work, our right to, to enjoy life, our, our right to, to, to travel. Everything that we have depends on having life. And while many of the differences between candidates have to do uh, with disagreeing on the policy, while adhering to the principle. So, for example, people might have different ideas about how to reduce crime or poverty, but you don't find them campaigning on the right to crime or the right to poverty. They aren't looking for ways to expand crime or to make more people poor. It's a difference where they agree on the principle, but they disagree on what's the best way to implement it, what's the best way to get there. They agree on the, the destination, they disagree on the route to, to reach the destination. On most things, it's a disagreement about policy rather than principle. But on some things, it is a disagreement on principle. The right to life, for example. While we do not see candidates campaigning for the right to commit crime, we do see candidates campaigning for the right to kill babies. This is, I know it's, it's astonishing. And when we put it in those terms, it's really quite unbelievable. But it's completely true, 100% accurate. We actually have candidates not talking about what's the best way to protect babies, what's the best way to protect them. Oh, we agree they should be protected, but we have different policies on how to protect them. That's not the disagreement when it comes to the matter of abortion. The disagreement is on whether or not to protect them, whether it's okay to kill them. Not a disagreement about the ways to stop the killing, 
but a disagreement on whether or not we have a right to kill them. They actually campaign on the right to kill a baby, those who are supportive of abortion. The Democratic Party platform says that there is a right to abortion. The Republican Party platform says that the baby has a right to life and must be protected. That's not a, just a policy difference, my friends. That's a difference in principle. A principle which goes back to the very founding of our country when in the Declaration of Independence it says we have a God-given right to life and that governments exist to secure that right. A principle that goes right to the heart of this gospel and the Word of God that says that we are under His dominion. In every age, O Lord, You have been our refuge. God, the giver of our life, the protector of our well-being. The right to life is rooted right there in the Scriptures as well as in the, the, the founding documents of our country. That's why St. John Paul II wrote the following words when he talks about you know, all the different issues that candidates argue about and that party platforms differ on. Listen to what he says to the voters. This is St. John Paul II. Above all, the common outcry which is justly made on behalf of human rights, for example, the right to health, to home, to work, to family, to culture, is false and illusory if the right to life the most basic and fundamental right and the condition for all other personal rights is not defended with maximum determination. That's from 1988, a document called Christi Fidelis Leici, number 38. John Paul II. So you're crying out for health care. Yeah, but if you're pro-choice on abortion, your stance on health care is an illusion, this pope, this saint is saying. It's an illusion because you are saying that the very people that you're concerned should get health care could have been killed in the womb, and you'd be okay with that. So how can you really be concerned about their health care if you're not even concerned about their life? St. John Paul II here is challenging every pro-choice candidate, every pro-abortion political party to say you can't speak up about health care when you're in favor of killing the very people that are supposed to have it. You can't do it. It's an illusion. If people think, oh, you're great on health care, and meanwhile, oh, I'm in favor of abortion, sorry, you are not to be believed. You've lost your credibility. You've lost any claim on our trust. You've certainly lost your claim to our vote. You can't do it. Oh, I have a great education plan, some people will come along and say. Oh, but you know, abortion, it should be you know, permitted without restriction and taxpayers should even pay for it. So the very children that you're saying you care about because you want to give them a good education, you could have cut their arms and legs off when they were in the womb, and you're okay with that? So you're obviously not very concerned about their education if you're not even concerned about keeping their hands and arms connected to the rest of their bodies. False and illusory is the outcry for human rights when one is pro-abortion. False and illusory. The right to work There'll be candidates coming along saying to us, I have a great plan for workers. Yeah, except when those workers were still in the womb, they could have been dismembered, and that was okay with me. I even wanted you to pay for it with your tax dollars. This common outcry on behalf of human rights is false and illusory if you're not defending the right to life, which is the condition for those other rights. How much more clear does this need to be? Now, the United States bishops, some years after John Paul spoke those words, said these words in their document, Living the Gospel of Life. Any politics of human life must work to resist the violence of 
war, the scandal of capital punishment, and seriously address issues of racism, poverty, hunger, employment, education, housing, and health care. But being right in such matters, and they have right in quotations, being right in such matters can never excuse a wrong choice when it comes to direct attacks on innocent human life. Indeed, the failure to protect and defend life in its most vulnerable stages renders suspect, renders suspect any claim to the rightness of positions in other matters affecting the poorest and least powerful of the human community. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. Be an active and faithful citizen. Be an informed and active voter, so that you can elect public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. If a politician can't respect the life of a little baby, how is he or she supposed to respect your life and mine? How? Let's ask and answer that question today. Let's challenge political candidates and parties to answer that question today. Before we even think about any other issues. We've got to settle this one. If you can't respect the life of a little baby, if you're in favor of a policy that allows them to be torn apart and thrown in the garbage and you even want taxpayers to pay for it, and that is the position of the Democratic Party, well then how in God's name, how in the name of anything that is rational, can you expect us to think you respect our lives? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. My friends, in a time of violence, in a time of uncertainty, let us be certain of this that we can survive as a nation and as a culture only when our leaders are committed to the respect and defense of the most defenseless human lives. Jesus, thank you for your teaching on our political responsibility. Lord, there is only one way to go, and that is the protection of the most fundamental good that you yourself have given us human life. And we pray, Jesus, for your salvation, which means not only the salvation of our souls, but of our bodies, the salvation of our relationships, of our communities. Indeed, Lord Jesus, point us to that new heavens and new earth where your righteousness will dwell and where there will be no more death or violence or crying out or pain. The former things will have passed away. Behold, the Lord says, I make all things new. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.